Hello and welcome to the channel. For this video, I wanted to go back to a story which at the time was overshadowed by another high profile crime. Suzanne Kappa's story isn't only a tragic one, but one that demonstrates just how truly evil people can be. I've titled the video the way I have because Suzanne's story has similarities to that of Kellyanne Bates, a case I've covered here before. Like Kelly, Suzanne was subjected to a prolonged period of abuse which would last several days. However, in this case, six people would be found to be responsible for this abhorrent crime. A word of warning, this video won't be for the faint-hearted. Parts of this story may be disturbing to some viewers. And so if you're ready, let's begin. Suzanne Kappa, born in Manchester 1976, was described by her stepfather John as a high-spirited, well-mannered girl who wanted nothing more in life than to be loved. However, she was also said to be easily influenced. Suzanne never knew her biological father, but she did live with her mother Elizabeth and her stepfather John. She also had a younger sister, Michelle. Her home life was less than ideal, it was said that her mother failed to show her the love and affection one would come to expect, and by 1990, Elizabeth's marriage to John would end in divorce. Desperate for love and affection, and with little to no friends, Suzanne would play truant from school, and would often spend nights at the homes of other people. At the time, she and John were living in Morton, Manchester. One of the homes that Suzanne would often frequent was 97 Langworthy Road. In the home lived Jean Powell, 26, and her three children. Her friend, Bernadette McNeely, 24, and her three children, lived at 91 Langworthy Road, but spent far more time at Jean's than at her own place. People would often be seen coming in and out of the house, most notably 39-year-old Glyn Powell, Jean's ex-husband, Clifford Pook, Jean's 18-year-old brother, and two other men that Jean was having sexual relations with, 16-year-old Anthony Dudson and 26-year-old Jeffrey Lee. Dudson was also sexually involved with Bernadette. Suzanne would be introduced to Jean in 1990 after she had begun babysitting for her children. Her stepfather was wary of Suzanne attending the home, explaining that he had a strange feeling about Jean and those who frequented what he called a house of evil. He later said, quote, I tried to stop Suzanne going there, but she had a very strong will. Unfortunately for John, he wasn't fully aware of the goings-on within 97 Langworthy Road. Inside the run-down house, there would regularly be parties where drugs such as amphetamines would be openly distributed. Bernadette herself was a drug addict, whereas Glyn and Jeffrey were both convicted criminals with the latter reportedly sinking as low as to steal from his own 86-year-old grandmother. Additionally, various criminal activities would occur at the home, in particular drug dealing, and also stolen car parts were sprawled all throughout the home. Needless to say, these people weren't exactly what you'd consider to be model citizens. Suzanne, however, saw them differently. Her younger sister Michelle said that Suzanne would do anything for them, but in return, she would be bullied by all six of them relentlessly. Over time, she would stay there more often, leading a now worried John to plead for her to come back home, only for Suzanne to decline. However, this wasn't out of fear of Jean and her regular visitors. Instead, it was out of a warped sense of loyalty to them. Up until now, Suzanne never had companionship in her life. A father she never knew. A mother who seemingly cared little for her. Here, despite the abuse, she felt a sense of human contact. The thought of ending it and going back to what she knew was too difficult for her. Although in late 1992, the bullying escalated further and Jean would attack Suzanne, beating her badly. Suzanne fled the house and made her way back to her mother's home. When she arrived, she knocked on the door 
and when her mother answered, she asked to be let inside to stay the night. Elizabeth, however, turned her own daughter away, saying that her new boyfriend at the time wouldn't allow it. Despite begging to be let in, Elizabeth continued to refuse to help her own daughter. And with nowhere else to go, Suzanne would eventually return to 97 Langworthy Road. A decision that would ultimately prove fatal. By the 7th of December 1992, Suzanne was back living with her stepfather, and it was here that Jean and Bernadette would find her. Now before I go on to explain what happens next, you need to understand the so-called justification behind the utterly sickening acts which were about to take place. For Jean Powell, it was because Suzanne had allegedly tried to get her to sleep with a man in exchange for money. For Bernadette McNeely, she accused Suzanne of stealing a pink duffel coat. But they all collectively blamed Suzanne, after Anthony Dudson, Glynn and Jean Powell, as well as Bernadette, contracted pubic lice. Dudson would later claim in court that he had sexual relations with Suzanne, although this is disputed. He'd also say that he contracted the lice after sleeping in a bed Suzanne used a few nights before. Regardless, instead of looking at their own actions, they collectively agreed that Suzanne had to pay for this. They reached out to her and convinced her to come to 97 Langworthy Road, under the guise that a boy she fancied was there and wanted to speak to her. When she arrived, Suzanne quickly learned this wasn't true. Immediately, Suzanne was pinned down, whereby Glynn proceeded to shave her head and eyebrows clean off. Afterwards, she was forced to clean up and place her hair in a bin. They then placed a plastic bag over her head and she was forced to walk around while everyone took turns hitting her. Eventually, Suzanne fell to the ground and while she was curled up, both Jean and Bernadette took turns kicking Suzanne as well as beating her with three foot long wooden ornaments and whipping her with a belt. The injury sustained here alone caused her to lose function in one arm, which would last throughout her entire ordeal. She was then taken into Jean's bathroom, where she was forced to shave her pubic hair. This was, as they claimed, ritualistic revenge after both Anthony Dudson and Bernadette McNeely shaved their own hair to rid themselves of their pubic lice. Following this, Jean Powell then locked Suzanne in a small cupboard overnight. The following day, Suzanne was moved to another cupboard in the home, but as her constant screams and cries for help were disturbing the six children, she was taken to Bernadette's home and placed in a downstairs back room. Here, she was tied to an upturned bed spread eagle using electrical flex. Her mouth was stuffed with socks to muffle her screams. The next five days for Suzanne were utter hell. Suzanne was regularly beaten and injected with amphetamines to prevent her from sleeping. She was burned on her face and body with cigarettes and forced to wear headphones, which played at maximum volume. They would play one song, Hi, I'm Chucky, wanna play? A rave song by 150 volts. Before her torture would begin, McNeely would start off by saying, Chucky's coming to play. Suzanne would understandably begin screaming in fear, fully aware as to what was about to happen. A couple of days later, Clifford Pook and Jeffrey Lee would visit, where they'd see Suzanne blindfolded, gagged and tied to the bed. She had been covered in her own urine and feces for several days. Overwhelmed by the smell, they removed her from the bed and placed her in a bath full of concentrated disinfectant. She was scrubbed with a stiff brush so hard that her skin began to peel off. Once she was tied up again, Clifford Pook then took a pair of pliers and would begin to extract her teeth. Anthony Dudson would later say of this experience, quote, I was stood at the doorway with Jeannie and Bernie. Cliff took her gag off. He told her to open her mouth. He said, right, I'm going to rip your teeth out. He started hitting her teeth with the pliers. He got the pliers on and started pulling it out, 
but it just snapped and chipped. Then he hit them a few more times. He put the pliers on again and really, really pulled. He pulled Suzanne's head forward until there was a snap and he had the tooth in the pliers. He did the same again and he was laughing. One of the most heartbreaking aspects of this story is that there were opportunities for Suzanne to be rescued. A man named David Hill, 18 at the time, was asked to house sit, and while he was there, he heard Anthony Dudson shouting in another room. When he asked what was going on, Jeffrey Lee took him to Suzanne Kappa. Hill said he saw Suzanne tied to the base of an upturned bed in a padlocked room. He also said that she had some kind of cloth over her face from just above her eyebrows to just below her nose. She had no hair. At one point, he was left alone with Suzanne. The following is what David Hill would later say. She asked me if I could help her, but I told her I couldn't. I asked her who she was. She said her name was Suzanne. She asked me if I could untie her. I said I couldn't do anything. I thought they would batter me. If I'd said anything, they'd all have got me, wouldn't they? I didn't know what to do. I was too shocked to do anything. Not only this, but Jeffrey Lee and Anthony Dudson also helped Michelle Kappa's fiancé Paul Barlow repair his car during Suzanne's ordeal. Had they said something, anything at the time, things may have been different. Paul himself later said, quote, They could have told me there and then. The door would have been kicked down and I would have got Suzanne out. I did not think they were capable of such savagery. Now all I want is 10 minutes with them in a back room. The decision was made to move Suzanne out of the home on the 14th of December 1992, after the gang learned that Suzanne's family were to report her missing. They stole a white Fiat Panda and forced her into the boot of the car. Inside the car were Bernadette McNeely, Anthony Dudson and both Glynn and Jean Powell. They drove about 15 miles to a narrow lane in Werneth Low near Romilly, which is just on the outskirts of Stockport. Reportedly, McNeely was giggling throughout the entire journey. Suzanne was then removed from the boot and forced into the woods, where she would be pushed down an embankment, rolling through leaves and brambles. Thorns would also cut into her feet as she walked. McNeely then poured petrol over the terrified girl, and attempted to set her alight. However, McNeely appeared to struggle, although Glyn Powell and Anthony Dudson took over, and within a matter of moments, the petrol ignited, and Suzanne was set on fire. While Suzanne screamed in agonising pain, McNeely sang Burn, Baby Burn, lyrics from the Tramp song Disco Inferno. Eventually, the scream stopped, and Suzanne was motionless. Believing her to no longer be alive, the four got into the stolen panda and made their way back to Jean's house where they would meet up with Clifford Pook and Jeffrey Lee. They bought beer from a newsagent on their way home, presumably to celebrate a job well done. However, there was one thing the gang didn't bet on. Suzanne was still alive. Incredibly, Suzanne still had some fight left in her and with all her energy, she managed to stagger her way up the embankment and walk a quarter of a mile despite her injuries. She was found near a golf course by Barry Sutcliffe and two of his colleagues at 10 past six in the morning while on their way to work. They immediately took her and made their way to the nearby home of Michael and Margaret Coop. Barry Sutcliffe would later say, quote, She said she had been held for over a week in a flat somewhere she wasn't sure where, and she had been injected with drugs, and that she had been brought up here and dumped. While the coops would go on to add, Both her hands appeared like ash. Her legs were just like raw meat, and her feet appeared to be badly charred. I was struck by how polite the victim was. She was constantly thanking my wife for her assistance. I instinctively went to put my arms around her, but she pulled away because she could not bear to be touched. Her head was shaved, and there were recent, not new, cuts to her head. 
Her face was almost featureless. Her hands were red raw and black at the fingertips. Her legs were red from top to bottom. She couldn't bear anything near her legs. Unable to hold anything due to her injuries, Suzanne drank six glasses of water with the help of Margaret. Emergency services would be called and Suzanne was rushed to Stockport Infirmary where she would later be transferred to the Specialist Burns Unit at Withington. Police were able to speak with Suzanne who had sustained burns to over 80% of her body and she was able to name all the people responsible for her ordeal. At around half past seven that morning, all six were arrested at 97 Langworthy Road. Jean Powell and Bernadette McNeely reportedly were laughing and joking with each other as they were arrested. Initially, they all denied any involvement. However, Anthony Dudson was the first to crack after his father convinced him to come clean and tell the truth. Suzanne's condition would gradually worsen and she would slip into a coma which she would never wake from. On the 18th of December 1992, Suzanne Kappa finally succumbed to her injuries. By the end, her mother and stepfather were unable to recognise their daughter, who was only positively identifiable from a partial thumbprint. Jean Powell, Glyn Powell, Bernadette McNeely, Jeffrey Lee, Clifford Pook and Anthony Dudson were all charged with murder, conspiracy to cause bodily harm and false imprisonment. Their trial, which began on the 16th of November 1993, lasted 22 days. On the 18th of December 93, the verdicts were in. Bernadette McNeely, Jean and Glyn Powell were found guilty of all charges and sentenced to 20 years for false imprisonment, 20 years on a conspiracy charge and handed life imprisonment with a minimum tariff of 25 years for the murder of Suzanne Kappa. Jeffrey Lee pled guilty to false imprisonment and was sentenced to 12 years behind bars. He was acquitted of the murder and conspiracy charges. Anthony Dudson pled guilty to the false imprisonment charge and was sentenced to 15 years prison. He was also found guilty of the conspiracy charge and sentenced to 15 years and also for the murder of Suzanne Kappa. Due to his age at the time, he was sentenced to indefinite detainment with a minimum tariff of 18 years. Finally, Clifford Pook. He too was acquitted of murder, but pled guilty to both the false imprisonment and conspiracy charges. He was handed 15 year sentences for each crime. All convictions were to be served concurrently. Reportedly, as the sentences were read out, two of the jurors wept as cries of yes, yes, could be heard from the public gallery. A statement was read to the press by Detective Inspector Peter Wall, who led the investigation after the sentences were handed out. In it, he said the following. Psychological reports say that these are absolutely sane individuals. It's frightening that they are such ordinary people. There is nothing special about any of them. As news of what happened to Suzanne caught the attention of the media, they immediately latched on to the Chucky connection. And it was also unusual in that the two ringleaders, Jean Powell and Bernadette McNeely, happened to be women. Additionally, links were made to the James Bolger case after it emerged that John Venables' father, Neil, was an avid horror movie watcher and had rented Child's Play 3 mere weeks before the young toddler was murdered. This along with Bernadette's actions during Suzanne Kappa's ordeal, resulted in Tom Holland, the director of the first Child's Play film, to come out and defend the movie, saying that the viewers of horror movies could only be influenced if they were unbalanced to begin with. David Elstein, who was head of programs at Sky TV at the time, also dismissed the cause and effect link between the two crimes and violent films, labelling it, quote, a false story, branded into the consciousness of the media. He also said, There is no reason to believe that Suzanne Kappa would be alive today if the audio tape had instead contained the torture scene from King Lear or a catchphrase from Bruce Forsyth. But the child's play hair has been running ever since the last day of the James Bolger murder trial. In April 1994, Professor Elizabeth Newson published Video Violence and the Protection of Children 
the Newson Report. She claimed that she had definitively found links between violent films and real-life atrocities, but the report failed to demonstrate this, instead relying heavily on heavily speculative accounts from the media, rather than through independent first-hand research. Newsom would give an oral presentation to the House of Commons Home Affairs Select Committee on Video Violence, citing the Suzanne Kappa case and its links with child's play. However, Sir Ivan Lawrence, former Conservative MP and criminal barrister, whose most notable client was British serial killer Dennis Nielsen, pointed out the inaccuracies in her findings, as well as stating that both the police and the British Board of Film Classification had not found any connection between what happened to Suzanne and the horror film. Regardless, as a result of the media putting attention on child's play and both murders, a decision was made to delay the certification for both natural born killers and reservoir dogs. Now to a part of the case that frustrates me more than I'd like to admit on video. Jeffrey Lee appealed against his sentence and on the 4th of November 1994, his false imprisonment charge was reduced from 12 years to just nine. He was released on license in 1998, which has since expired. Clifford Pook is also a free man after being released on license in May of 2001. This too has expired. While Glynn and Jean Powell remain locked up, the same cannot be said for Bernadette McNeely. After initially having her sentence reduced by a year, she was released from prison in 2015, apparently being labelled as a model prisoner throughout her time inside. This was despite the fact that after a routine check of her cell back when she was in HM Prison Durham in 1996, letters were uncovered which exposed an affair between a married prison governor named Mike Martin and McNeely. However, before any disciplinary action could be taken, Mike Martin handed in his resignation. She was also said to be in a romantic relationship with Moore's murderer Myra Hindley before being transferred to HM Prison Newhall immediately after her affair was exposed, where she would go on to share a wing with Rose West. After her release, she would go on to live in the same housing block as Karen Matthews. If you're not aware who she is, Karen was the subject of one of my earlier videos. Needless to say, she's dubbed Britain's worst mum for a reason. Then there's Anthony Dudson. He too appealed his sentence, and in 2002, this was reduced from 18 years minimum to just 16. He would appeal again, saying that the reduction was insufficient, but this was dismissed on the 21st of November 2003. However, he was later moved to an open prison in 2009. While digging further, I found out something that, to my knowledge, I've not seen anyone else mention. While most sources list him as still being in prison, in 2013, a parole board granted his release from prison after stating he, and I quote, posed no risk to the public. While I couldn't find anything to suggest this was overturned or upheld, it does mean that potentially he too is a free man. Personally, the mere fact any of them are out walking the streets is an example of the justice system failing the victims and their families. Thank you for watching. This was a very difficult case, but one I felt needed telling. While I don't personally subscribe to the line of logic that horror movies cause violence, seeing as though I often review horror movies on Proper Horror Show's channel with no ill effects, I could see why the media would latch on to that narrative. When I first began researching the case, I initially believed that Gene Powell was the ringleader. However, as I dug further, it soon became apparent that to me it was actually Bernadette. How she can be walking the streets after all she did, after all the torment she and those other monsters did to Suzanne, is unimaginable. Yet here we are. At this point, I'm no longer surprised when I see ridiculous sentences handed out. None of them should be free. None of them. In my opinion, each one is just as reprehensible as the other. I understand that some people can be rehabilitated, but there must be a point where a line is drawn. How it wasn't drawn in this case will forever baffle me. But let me know what you think in the comment section below. 
and if you found this case informative, please consider subscribing to the channel. Until next time, take care and goodbye for now.